uh, the securing se mobile crypto coin wallets. I think it's a fancy title, but I had to come up with one so I could get into the, this conference. You'll see it's actually, I hope, a pretty down to earth presentation. A little bit about myself because, obviously. Um, I started in 2007 working as a software developer, mostly C++, some .NET. I spent four years at that company, and after that I needed a change of pace, so I, go, I went to a um, mobile game development company uh, where um, I got promoted to, a, to the function of position of iOS lead, so I spent some time trying to figure out ways to block attackers, in our case, cheaters, so people who are trying to get away with uh, hacking our games. Hacking is probably the wrong word here, cracking, let's say. Um, if you know mobile games, you, you know there are a lot of in-app purchases, so people try to get away with uh, getting free currency and advancing without having to pay. After four years there, I started a year and a half ago approximately at my current company, CGCA, where I was hired to work as a blockchain developer. This came uh, because of my interest in Bitcoin mostly, but you'll see that it's not only about Bitcoin. There are a lot, of, a lot more crypto coin currencies out there. Uh, I made this drawing myself, I hope you like it. The point was, that how it feels to be in this blockchain business nowadays. It's like trying sometimes to jam a square peg through a round hole. And I'll explain more in the next slide. The problem right now is that a lot of um, financial companies are experimenting with uh, blockchain because, I don't know, I guess they think blockchain is cool, but they also understand some of the benefits. However, they are not ready to let go of their uh, already established procedures. So, there are two main concerns when you're trying to implement a business blockchain solution. One is that blockchains were really developed to be a distributed public ledger, which means all transactions are public, everybody can see them, and it's about a sort of trust through technology, whereas companies, financial institutions, want to keep their data private, obviously. You wouldn't want your bank to publish all your transactions online, into a, especially on, sorry, on a distributed server, uh, system, sorry. The other issue, of course, is the fact that blockchains are, by definition, um, highly distributed systems sort of a democratic computing system, whereas uh, financial institution, institutions rely on um, centralized servers for obvious reasons. So the issue is how do we make these two play together? I don't, I, I, will, I, will, not try to dis, I will not try to mislead you, I don't have an answer. I'm just presenting the situation as it is right now. Uh, if you search the internet for blockchain, you'll see that a lot of companies are trying to experiment with it. You've got IBM, Microsoft is developing blockchain as a service systems in Azure. IBM has the Hyperledger initiative. NASDAQ launched a private equities trading platform. I think it's private equities, I'm not sure. Called LinQ, I think, which runs on a blockchain. But enough about uh, business and all that. Let's talk about the technical fun stuff, at least for me. Uh, sorry if that uh, was kind of silly. Um, you probably all know Bitcoin, so the original uh, cryptocurrency and what really started the blockchain. I wouldn't call it revolution, but it's an evolution anyway. Um, the other, uh, it's a bit dark, but uh, in the left corner there's Ethereum, which is the current contender to Bitcoin. Now Ethereum uh, evolved based, 
uh, evolve the concept of a distributed ledger by adding a state machine on top of the um, distributed ledger, allowing you to write so-called smart contracts. So instead of just having a transaction, a transfer of value, um, you can write a stateful object, which is like an object in Java or C++. It has its special programming language. And um, you can try to code actual legal contracts. Uh, the simplest example would be like an insurance. If certain conditions are met, then transfer funds to a certain address. Of course, the embedded cryptocurrency for Ethereum is something called Ether. So you could make payments in Ether. You couldn't. You can't make payments in Euro, dollars, or whatever. Um, then uh, there's Ripple, one of the earlier forks of Bitcoin that I've worked with. Um, Ripple takes away the um, proof of work, which is the hash cash algorithm. You know what miners are doing. Miners on Bitcoin, they're always trying to find a hash which has a certain, which meets a certain criteria, and the first one who finds that uh, hash uh, is give a word on the a word, a word it, sorry, the current block uh, bounty. Uh, of course, there are, usually there's not one miner; there's a pool of miners who is doing that. Ripple took away that took away that process and works on a, something called a consensus-based algorithm, and you can. Uh, Google uh, things like uh, Byzantine fault tolerance, which is what they're actually doing, which means that if at least 80% of the network agrees that a certain transaction is valid, then we'll, everybody will accept that transaction as valid. Uh, what they're basing their theory on is that they expect that not more than 50%, not the entire network will not collude to introduce corrupted transactions. And you can, um, rip, you can see that Ripple uh, has already been quite successful in building its business case. It's working with banks. Uh, they are targeting international money transfers, something that is not very well regulated now. You, and the bank system itself does not make this easy. Then there's Monero, maybe you've heard of it. Monero is a crypto coin like Bitcoin, but it focuses on privacy. Whereas with Bitcoin, if you're not careful, your IP address and all your personal details can be revealed during transactions. Monero focuses on um, privacy, having a crypto coin that is harder or probably very hard to trace back to the one who spends it. And then um, if you follow crypto coin news, Zcash has been making a splash lately. It's also a privacy oriented crypto coin. Um, it uses something called um, homomorphic cryptography to hide both the value of the transaction and the sender and the receiver of the transaction. I guess some people find that useful. So what about you? Do you use Bitcoin? Do you like it? <laughs> cool. So if you use Bitcoin, how do you store your Bitcoins? Do you do it offline? Do you have some sort of air-gapped machine where you sign your transactions and then publish them on the internet with a client that is connected to the internet? Do you do it on your mobile phone? Do you do it on your computer? Uh, do you use some sort of hot cold wallet strategy? That means you have certain hot wallets, which are wallets which are uh, connected in, which are used to make the transfers, but your actual Bitcoins are stored, sorry, in um, a wallet that is on a machine not connected to the internet and you make the transaction from the cold wallet to the hot wallets there, nobody can steal your private key. And then from the hot wallets, you spend the funds. Um, and the big question, do you think using Bitcoin is easy? And if not, would you like to buy some Bitcoin? <laughs> I would certainly would like that. Uh, by the way, I heard that Bitcoin is going up now that Donald Trump was elected. So at least some good news. So at least my, in my opinion, Bitcoin is not easy to use because cryptography itself is hard to understand and use. So we'd have to find some way to strike a balance between 
usability and security. This is what it's all about. And in the case of Bitcoin, the one secret we need to keep hidden is the user's private key. And of course, we want to put control in the hands of the user. We don't want to have, like in the case of the bank, where you, uh, the bank controls your transactions. You're authorizing them through some form of authentication, but the bank itself executes the transaction. The whole point of Bitcoin was to give that power to you. So I looked at a couple of existing uh, Bitcoin wallet applications. Uh, I found Bither, which uses a cold and hot wallet approach. Um, as also as many other um, Bitcoin applications do, they ask you to remember a mnemonic password or store securely somehow, I guess, in a vault at home. Uh, which is, uh, if you've seen this, it's actually a series of words and those words can be translated into a private key but you can't easily remember it because it's a very long phrase that doesn't make any sense. Um, there's also Bread Wallet. I think it's more recent. Um, also based on this mnemonic passphrase thing, which can be, which is known also as BIP39, which is a Bitcoin improvement proposal for the protocol. Again, it stores the private key in the device's keychain and assuming you can compromise the device by jailbreaking it, the keychain is easily dumpable. I also found an application called Green Address which combines storing the private key in the keychain and also a mnemonic based passphrase with some sort of two-factor authentication, sending you an email, an SMS, something to uh, confirm that you are the holder of the address and I think they also use multi-signature so that you can't spend the money by yourself. You need a second signature uh, done by their servers which is enabled once you authenticate yourself. So in summary, we the most, uh, most solutions use a mem the mnemonic based authentication and maybe some second factor authentication. Again, all these require you to write down some sort of complicated password or store it securely somehow, which is not saying that much after all. I mean, I could just store my private key on, on a flash drive and store and keep it in a safe and make sure nobody can copy it. It's sort of the same thing, so it's kind of a old-fashioned approach, I would say. Or maybe use a, um, a third-party authenticator, like uh, they send you an SMS, you log in on to, to their server some credentials. That's fine, but it's also, like I said, a bit old-fashioned. Or they do both for extra security. What I'm saying is that, in my opinion, this is not the best approach. It's not easy to use and it's not always 100% secure. Of course, nothing is 100% secure, but we could try to find something better. All in all, I don't want to be a hater, so uh, it's actually a good level of usability and security. However, I do believe there is a way to make things a bit better. Yep. But there's a catch, and I'll talk to you about that later on to the presentation. In order to improve the current state of thing, the current state, you would have to take what they call a greenfield approach. I really like this word, word, and I wanted to use it in my presentation. So basically, it's going a bit back to the drawing board and not taking what has been built so far for granted and try to improve on the existing design, maybe uh, fork it or build it from scratch. So actually what I will pre be proposing later is that we change the original protocol and this is what I'm asking. So the second point there was you have to be willing to change the protocol. Something's gotta give, so to speak. And 
uh, the key point here is that we could start leveraging the security uh, enhancements that are found in everyday mobile devices. And by that I mean biometric sensors. Yes, almost all devices, so many devices now have touch uh, fingerprint sensors, which some would argue are easy to spoof, but let's face it, it takes a lot of um, doing. I don't think it's that, it's unless you are very adept at social engineering, I don't think it, it's very easy to steal a fingerprint, but let's say it's reasonably safe. Uh, then uh, mobile devices also contain hardware that accelerates cryptography, so it's no longer that much of a penalty hit if you're encrypting things. On iOS, you have the common crypto library and the security framework, um, which if starting from the iPhone 5S, which is powered by the A7 chip, also feature the secure enclave, which was my next point. On Android, I will admit that I haven't investigated a lot, but I did read that ARMv8 uh, A devices also feature um, hardware accelerated cryptography. And some Android devices have the so-called secure element, which can emulate the security found in a credit card. Um, also, I looked up a chip made by Atmel, which is quite inexpensive. It's called the Atmel ATECC508A, which does accelerated uh, hardware accelerated SHA256 and elliptic curve cryptography and some other things. So you could, in theory, build your uh, small embedded devices with hardware security. Uh, you can actually buy it as um, Arduino Shield if you want to experiment with it. So, on to what I'm actually proposing here. Um, I propose of using the secure enclave on the A7 chip, the iPhone 5S and later, uh, which has a very interesting feature. You can, uh, in a nutshell, you can generate the key pair, the elliptic curve key pair, which is used for all crypto coins inside the secure enclave, do the signing inside the secure enclave, and never have the key leave that enclave. So you just feed it the data, it signs it, gives you back the signed data. So unless you have some sort of sophisticated hardware attack tools, it's going to be very hard for you to retrieve the hardware key. Unless, I guess, unless you are the FBI or NSA, it's going to be near impossible. Um, and there's another point, even if the device is jailbroken, you still can't access that private key because it's stored in hardware. It's not in a file on the disk encrypted like uh, it was before um, the A7 chip. Of course, you'll need to take some extra measures to be sure that that key is stored in a secure enclave and not on the encrypted database, which is the keychain on iOS. So, in theory, what we could do is have the secure enclave generate the key pair, which will be your wallet, a private key and a public key. The, the Bitcoin, a Bitcoin address is actually a hash of a hash of the public address of an elliptic, key, elliptic curves key pair. Um, and like I said before, you can just sign your transaction in the secure enclave. In theory, totally secure and then submit the transaction to the network. Um, now the secure enclave itself is protected by whatever means of security you use on your phone. So if you're using a s simple four digit pin, it would be slightly easier to crack. Of course, then you have that delay when you have too many brute force attacks, it will stop you and give you a minute mm, delay or something like that. Um, if you're using a complex password, that's great. And you can use Touch ID to unlock your iPhone instead of the complex password, unless you restart it. When you restart it, you have to input the complex password. And like I said before, with this approach, the private key is never in RAM. So even if the device is jailbroken and you're fishing in the memory for the key, you'll never find it. So I said that in general, the secure enclave should be 
uh, safe against software-based attacks. Um, right. Also, you have to be careful how you write your code. You have to understand the security framework, which is an iOS framework for uh, manipulating the keychain. And also you'll have to unlock the item in the keychain. I things that you store in this secure database are called items. It's like a database where rows are called items and columns are called attributes, but I'll show you a bit more about that later. And the trick we tried to do with this in this uh, software solution was to have the user unlock the item with his fingerprint, so it felt more sci-fi, I guess. You could also unlock the, um, the keychain item with your passphrase if you wanted to for extra security. Uh, I don't know if this is helpful because probably you can't see it unless you're in the front row, but uh, I think it'd be more helpful when you download the presentation. Uh, this is, uh, these are the secret, se secret, sorry, secret incantations you have to go through in order to set up a keychain item that will be stored in, uh, actually here I'm generating the key pair. This is what you have to do to be sure that the key pair is generated inside the secure enclave and it's not just generated on the regular keychain. You have to set up some security attributes on the item and then the actual generation happens in set key generate key pair and it will return the public key and an opaque, opaque reference to the private key. You can never see the private key like I said before. But you can use this reference later on if you want to, to, um, to sign. You can, tell the, you can tell the framework, hey, sign with this private key. But you're not actually holding the private key, just a reference to it. And this is the signing part. Like I said before, um, I, ext I extract a reference to the private key, so not actually the private key and then I sign with it and I get a blob of data that is the signed data. Um, if you're not familiar with this, this is Swift code. All right, and now to the big problem. Like I was saying at the beginning of my presentation, there's a mismatch between what Business, use, business users want and what the Bitcoin cryptocurrency communities in general want to develop. In my case, the problem was that um, Bitcoin and every other cryptocurrency out there uses um, elliptic curve algorithm called CACP256K1. And this is actually, if you know a bit about elliptic curve cryptography, uh, it's a different curve. You have different parameters which generate a different curve. While the security standard, the NIST whatever standard, it, with NIST P256, is actually another curve, the CACP256 R1. And this is the elliptic curve algorithm that is implemented in the secure enclave. So, I can't, I couldn't actually sign Bitcoin transactions with the secure enclave. Uh, there's also a rumor that uh, the P256 uh, elective curve has some NSA backdoor in the random number generator. I can't deny or confirm that. So what I did was modify the algorithm. Yeah, I already talked about this. Satoshi, for some reason, picked a different elliptic curve than what is the industry standard. So what I actually did was modify Ripple in my case, so that all addresses inside the Ripple are generated using the P256 elliptic curve instead of the standard one. Luckily, Ripple uses OpenSSL as the crypto library, so it wasn't that hard to change. And I've made available the fourth Ripple, uh, Ripple server here, if you are curious how that works. It's on a separate branch called CACP 256R1. I never tried to issue a pull request if they were accepted, probably not. 
And the iOS application um, is available at the second link. Now I'll show you somewhat of a not very exciting demo with uh, me signing um, a hard-coded um, transaction on my iPhone. Here we see the um, elliptic curve public key represented as a Ripple and a Bitcoin address. I am sending myself the public key via email, just to be sure. We have the public key as an encrypted hex number. It's actually hex blob, it's not a number. And then I will hit sign, which prompts me to authenticate so that it can access the secure enclave and generate the signed transaction data. I then email this transaction data. I didn't build a very user-friendly demo. And I think that slide is done. Okay, then uh, I take that uh, signed transaction data on my computer and I submit it to my uh, modified Ripple network. It's probably very small. I don't know how to zoom in further. And probably not very exciting. So in here I have the signed transaction data, which is a binary representation of the transaction that I want to submit on top of which it has, which has also been encrypted with the private key. This is the transaction data that I want to submit. It contains my public key and some value transfer. And then I take that and submit it to my uh, running Ripple server. And you can, if you were close enough, you could see that it said transaction was applied only valid in a published ledger. A ledger is what uh, Ripple is calling blocks. I guess there was more, but let's skip through it. So that's it. I hope uh, you walked away with something from this and Maybe you'll convince people to use Bitcoin and maybe you'll find someday an understanding between the business communities and the crypto coin communities. Any questions? Yeah? So one of your requirements was uh, that the user has full control over all the data. And you dismissed, well, I mean, you didn't explicitly say that, but I think you dismissed those web-based Bitcoin wallets because the user does not necessarily have full control over everything. With this enclave approach, how does the user get full control over everything? You mean I don't have actually have the private key, is that what you're saying? Uh, probably, yes. Well, it's on my device. So I own it. If uh, Apple owns it, sorry. Hmm? Apple owns it. What, sorry? Apple owns your device. That's how you see it. <laughs> but even if they own that device, they could never extract the information from the secure enclave. So the data I put there is mine. Fair enough. Have you looked into uh, TPM-based solutions? I don't know what TPM is. Fair enough. Ah, you mean like hardware tokens? Modern hardware ships the trusted platform module, uh -huh. which, uh, well, its sole purpose is to hide keys from users, which I think uh, the Apple Enclave thing does as well. But, right. I mean, the TPM is standardized, and every, every modern platform has one of those. Like Intel SGX, you mean? No, I mean TPM. Okay. No, the point uh, to this experiment was to make something that uh, works on a mobile device so that it's very user friendly. Not necessarily an enterprise environment. But thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, I thought about that one. 
Uh, yeah, in theory, you could uh, store your private key on the UB key. Um, I did see a, a thread on one of the Ethereum forums. Uh, a guy had developed an applet for the UB key uh, that you could load and it would do the signing for you. But you would have to have a developer enabled UB key. I didn't fully investigate that, but yeah, in theory, you could do it. Of course, that only works on computers, not on mobile devices. How do you plug a UB key into a phone? Right, but not on an iPhone. Anyone else? Okay, then thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you very much.